Um, my group actually studies corals and specifically the symbiosis and the mechanisms of acclimation and adaptation they have to respond to climate change. But for today, I chose to present um, something not as doom and gloom as the, as the usual work that we're doing. And uh, it came about looking a bit more, studying the symbiotic relationship that you already heard about that these organisms have with uh, photosynthetic dinoflagellates. And to give you some numbers on what you already heard from Timothy, the importance of coral reefs, we're really talking about hot spots of biodiversity in our oceans, right? These ecosystems cover only 0.1 to 0.2 percent of the ocean floor, but they support more than 30% of all known marine species. So we're really talking about ecologically important ecosystems. But they're not only important from an ecological perspective, they're also economically important, right? There's an estimated 9.9 .9 trillion USD contribution to the global economies from all the various services that they provide. And more than 500 million people are directly or indirectly dependent on this ecosystem for the livelihoods. These ecosystems support fisheries in many countries, for example, the Red Sea, where my university is situated, you don't find large industrial fisheries. It's really artisanal fishers like this one here, going out and fishing in the coral reefs. And if you look at many, many coastal population in the tropics, coral reefs are the main source of proteins for them. So we're really talking about a huge problem. Um, now, there are other services that these ecosystems provide that are not as obvious. For example, shoreline protection. You can really nicely see in this picture how the structures that they build break the waves and dissipate the wave energy and basically protect the shores from erosion, which is relevant to many of these smaller island states in the tropics. And of course, ecotourism. You heard it already. Um, countries like, for example, Egypt or even Okinawa, like Tim said, they really depend on tourists to come there and to dive at the beautiful coral reef sites. Now what is interesting is that most people when they see pictures like that, they immediately think, oh nice crystal clear water, these are pristine environments. But yes, they are pristine, but the water is also crystal clear, but we're actually looking at ocean deserts. So these environments are extremely poor in nutrients. So how can it be that corals can build one of the most productive and biodiverse ecosystems in what you would consider to be an ocean desert, right? And believe it or not, but one of the first scientists to ponder this question was actually this guy here, right? When Charles Darwin set out on the Beagle, he did not go out to formulate the, uh, the uh, theory of evolution. He actually wanted to study coral reefs. He wanted to understand how the different types of reefs are formed, right? And he already understood by throwing in his plankton nets that these regions are very poor in nutrient. And he asked himself, how can they build something like this in an environment like that? And this is why this question was actually termed the Darwin paradox. So, just to give you a very short overview of corals, we're looking at comparably simple organisms. Most corals are colonies comprised of hundreds to thousands of small little polyps that you can see here, right? And they're very simple in architecture. They only have two tissue layers, an epidermis and a gastrodermis. And within the gastrodermis lies the secret because this is where they carry the photosynthetic endosymbiont. So dinoflagellates, living inside the gastrodermal cells, doing photosynthesis and passing on the photosynthesis to the host. Now, a lot of work that we do, we do not in corals because they're very complicated to keep, they're very complicated to work with. So instead, we're using this beauty here, just the sea anemone aptasia. It's a sea anemone that has the same symbionts as corals, and we've done a lot of studies and can show that basically what we find in the sea anemone can also be translated to corals. And we've been doing quite a lot of work over the years in this organism. And this project that I'm presenting today, this study was actually based on a study that we published 2019 when we did a meta-analysis on transcriptomic data comparing symbiotic and non-symbiotic aptasia. There's been four data sets out there that people have produced using exactly the same genotype. The interesting thing is that the number 
of genes that respond to symbiosis range from more than 9,000 to 2,500. So the same genotype, just experiments performed in different labs, gives you completely different numbers of differentially expressed genes, and when you ask the question, okay, what is the overlap, you come up with 300 genes that respond consistently across all the studies. So we thought, okay, let's put all data sets together, do a meta-analysis and see, is there anything that we can find out, something that crystallizes? And what we found was a switch in the biosynthesis of the amino acid serine and glycine, which are then used to produce other amino acids. And what you can see here is down regulation in blue, up regulation in red in response to symbiosis. And what basically happens is that aposymbiotic anemones use choline that they get from heterotrophic feeding, and they then convert this into glycine and then later serine. However, as soon as they become symbiotic, they downregulate these genes and instead upregulate this part here. And this part, oh, I see that the slides are a bit, I hope that this doesn't come up in the other slides too, that as soon as they become symbiotic, they use glucose that they then use to assimilate waste ammonium into serine and glycine, right? And in an environment where nitrogen is very scarce, this basically now allows you to tap into these carbon backbones that your symbionts provides, the sugar that you get en masse, to actually assimilate this precious nutrient and to convert it uh, into biomass. And we then did a metabolomic analysis, in which you can see here in the plus and the minus, to look specifically at these metabolites and see do they actually respond like we would expect them from the gene expression changes, and yes, they do. Now this was our starting point. The problem is that when you do work with aptasia, people would usually take the entire anemone, smush it up, and extract the RNA. So it doesn't provide you any spatial information. So we asked, okay, Oh, this is basically uh, a model that we came up with. So we wanted to understand a bit more where is this happening. Now, based on this, on this data, we formulated a model for symbiosis where we basically said, okay, the aposymbiotic anemone gets food that it converts it to amino acid and ammonium is basically excreted. And as soon as it has symbionts, it can start using the sugar to basically uh, recycle its own waste ammonium. And this is the only connection that we have to climate change here because the beauty of this model is that it also explains why the symbiotic relationship is so sensitive to stress because based on this model, we formulated that the ability to recycle your own waste ammonium now also allows you to control your symbiont population because these symbionts are not limited by energy. They can use the sunlight to produce as much energy as they need, but what they require to proliferate is ammonium, iron, phosphate, right? And ammonium being the most scarce ones is what basically now limits their growth. And the host being able to control this by using the sugar allows it to control the symbiont population, basically like in a chemostat. Right? The problem being that if the ability to control your symbionts depends on what the symbionts provide to you, then anything that affects the productivity of the symbionts will also affect your ability to control them. So as soon as the symbionts do not translocate the sugar, you now need to catabolize your own proteins to get energy, which produces a lot of ammonium that can now fuel symbiont proliferation. And what was your friend before now becomes your enemy because it basically leaches out the ammonium, the nitrogen from the system. But we wanted to, as I said, look a bit deeper. So what we did is we took our anemones, the symbiotic ones and the non-symbiotic ones, and we used laser microdissection that was pre-single cell RNA-seq to separate the two tissues. We wanted to separate the epidermis and the gastrodermis and have a better view of what is going on transcriptionally in these two tissues. And we then defined um, five modules of gene expression that I'm going to show here. So basically module one, looking at genes that respond specifically to symbiosis in increasing their expression, so they're induced by symbiosis. Model two, uh, then, genes that are repressed by symbiosis, then we had genes that are specific to the symbiotic gastrodermis, then genes that are specific to gastrodermis-induced, 
and genes that are specifically to epidermis induced. But what interested us our most was, of course, the symbiosis induced genes. So what are the genes that are turned on in response to symbiosis? And we see the carbon and nitrogen cycling that I already showed before, because this is exactly what pops up, the GS go get cycle. So the biochemical pathway that allows you to recapture, recycle ammonium by converting it into um, glutamine. And um, cnidarians are, I think, the last animals um, that have this pathway. All animals, uh, more derived animals, have lost it because they're usually energy limited. They're not limited by nitrogen. They usually excrete the waste nitrogen um, in form of urea, mostly. But as I showed, corals and also aptasia can do that. So we wanted to look a bit closer into that and ask, okay, but what cells and how specifically within the tissues is this pathway um, activated? So that was when 10X released the chromium controller and we were able to do some single cell RNA-seq and ask this question uh, with a bit higher detail and resolution. So we ran our first analysis and we identified uh, 12 different cell clusters that we first had to find out what they are. For some it's quite easy, like cnidocytes, they're very specific. We have marker genes that are extremely specific for this cell type and you can see here Cell cluster 11 is the only one that expresses these genes in substantial numbers, so it was clear these are our cnidocytes. But what about the other cell clusters? Well, we were lucky that recently, when we got the data, a different group had published a single cell paper on the soft coral xenia, and they've basically done this work for us already. So what we now did is we took our cell clusters and correlated the expression profiles to theirs, right? And their symbiotic Cell cluster was cell cluster 16, so these were the symbiotic cells, and this correlated most highly with our cell cluster 10. So we then basically looked a bit closer into cell cluster 10, and yes, we could confirm that many of the other genes that we found to be specific to the cell cluster fitted with our hypotheses and, and our view of what these cells should be doing. Okay, so we asked the question, GS go get cycle, is it actually only expressed in cell cluster 10, or do we find it also to be expressed in other cell clusters? And what we see is that basically the GS gene, the glutamate synthase, is expressed in all cell types. So all cell types in symbiosis respond to, um, to symbiosis and start expressing glutamine synthetase, and the same is for the go guide. So we wondered, how can it be that it's not just the symbiotic cells, but actually almost all cells respond transcriptionally? So what is feeding this go get machinery in the different cell types? So we need for the pathway the carbon backbones, which are derived from sugar through the TCA cycle, and of course the waste ammonium. Waste ammonium is produced in almost all the cells. Okay, but the sugar we know comes from the symbionts. So we started to look at transporters, specifically ammonium transporters and glucose transporters. And we identified two ammonium transporters that responded strongly to symbiosis, AMT1 and RHBG1, and three glucose transporters. And this is the tissue specific data, and this is the single cell data. So we could basically see that symbiosis induces the expression of these genes in the gastrodermis, except for AMT1, which for some reason is induced in the epidermis. And when we look at the different cell clusters, we see, of course, cell cluster 10 expressing most of the genes highly, but also um, some of the other cells expressing these transporters. Now, the first thing we had to do is verify that the transporters do what we think they do, because with non model organisms, you usually rely on blast homology to annotate your genes. And only because blast tells you that it is a glucose transporter, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. Actually, uh, GLUT 8A was annotated as a tree halose transporter. So we got ourselves a uh, ammonium transporter yeast mutant and a glucose transporter yeast mutant. We cloned in our aptasia genes and we just 
verify that they are what they're supposed to be. And yes, you can see that they can actually rescue the respective phenotypes. So yes, they're really transporters for the substrates that we thought. So the next question was, where are these transporters expressed? So we got antibodies and started to look at tissue sections to see where they are localized in aposymbiotic and in symbiotic aptasia. And then we also looked at isolated cells. And as you can see in the aposymbiotic ones, the first two glucose transporters are not really expressed in aposymbiotic individuals. However, they are expressed quite highly in symbiotic individuals and specifically in the symbiotic gastrodermis. You can actually see these round cells that you do not see here. These are the symbionts, right? Glucose transporter 8 is a bit different. It is expressed in the aposymbiotic ones, mostly at the periphery of the tissue, so the side facing the water and the side facing the gastrovascular cavity. But in response to symbiosis, it basically really lights up. It is expressed very highly in the symbiotic gastrodermis. And you can see that it's even localized in the phagosome membrane, so the symbiosome membrane that surrounds the symbiont. It's taken up by phagocytosis, so it is enveloped with the uh, plasma membrane of the cell, and we can see the localization of this transporter. So we believe that is the one that facilitates the transport of glucose from the symbionts to the host. For the ammonium transporters, things looked a bit more interesting because we have this RHBG transporter that in aposymbiotic ones is expressed in the epidermis facing the water side. But as soon as they become symbiotic, we start to see a strong signal in the symbiotic gastrodermis. Interestingly, the AMT transporter shows a very speckled and mostly gastroderm-specific expression. And as soon as the anemone becomes symbiotic, it is now expressed where the RHBG transporter was expressed before. Now, the RHBG we also see in the plasma membrane, and we believe that this transporter might be facilitating the transport of nitrogen to the symbiont. But why would an organism basically swap at the periphery, one transporter for the other. So to ask this question, we have to do some bit more characterization of these ammonium transporters, so finding out what is the difference between them. And we looked specifically at directionality, because ammonium transporters can either be unidirectional or they can be bidirectional. So we did a methyl ammonium test, and the way it works is that methyl ammonium is toxic. So if you have only one transporter, and this transporter is unidirectional, will keep pumping in methyl ammonium into the cell until it reaches toxic levels and kills the yeast cell, right? If it's a bidirectional transporter, then it basically goes with the concentration gradient. So as soon as it reaches a certain concentration, inflow, outflow will be the same, and you will not reach the toxic levels. And as we can see here, the AMT transporter, if you give it methyl ammonium, Basically, the cells are not able to grow. But with the RHBG transporter, they can grow. So this would tell us that the AMT transporter is a unidirectional transporter, whereas the RHBG transporter transports ammonium bidirectionally. And this, of course, uh, makes a big difference because if AMT now switches to the periphery of the epidermis in symbiotic ones, it means that it starts pumping in ammonium from the outside environment into the cells. Whereas the translocation of the RHBG transporter to the symbiotic gastrodermis means that it can now facilitate the distribution of ammonium, A, to the symbionts, would basically function like a sink, like a nitrogen sink within the cell, but also distribute ammonium throughout the tissues to other cells depending on the concentration gradients. So what we believe is that it supports the symbiont but also distributes ammonium across animal cells. Okay. We then had a question about what is actually inducing the switch in expression of these ammonium transporters? Is it simply the presence of glucose? Is it enough to have glucose to make the organism respond by switching the localization of the transporters and increasing GS GOGAD activity? So what we did to test that was we took our aposymbiotic anemones, our symbiotic anemones, 
And then we took aposymbiotic ones that we just fed glucose. We just gave them um, a substantial amount of glucose and asked from a transcriptomic perspective, what do they look more like? Do they look more like, uh, more like aposymbiotic ones or like symbiotic ones? And as you can see here in green, we have en the enzymes and in purple, the transporters. It basically looks like the apos with glucose start to look more like symbiotic anemones. So they increase the expression of the gs go get cycle, they increase the expression of the AMT transporter. But if you look at the antibody stainings, you do not see the change in localization. So they do not respond by changing the localization of the transporters, they just respond metabolically by increasing the expression, but not changing the localization. And this basically tells us that there must be something that the symbion does to induce this change of expression that allows the host to actually funnel ammonium to them, to the symbionts themselves, and to also start distributing the sugar and even taking up more ammonium from outside. Now, this is all based on transcriptomics and some antibody stainings. The question is, does this physiologically actually happen? So we did another experiment where we wanted to look at the metabolic outcome to see if it actually fits with our expectations. And for this, we used nanosims and 13C bicarbonate and 15N ammonium labeling. Bicarbonate in water is converted to CO2, it's inert, the host cannot do anything with it, but the symbiont takes it up and via photosynthesis converts it into glucose. So we can now check where the carbon from the symbiont ends up, right? And by giving him 15 and ammonium, we basically do the same thing with the ammonium. And if our hypothesis is correct, that both get incorporated into amino acids, then by looking at the signals for the different isotopes, and these are aposymbiotic ones, you can see they cannot take up the 13C bicarbonate because they don't have symbionts. So if they really produce amino acids from both, then we would need to see a very strong correlation between the 13C and the 15N signal. And this is exactly what we see. So in aposymbiotic anemones, we do not see hardly any correlation between 13C and 15N signals. But as soon as they become symbiotic, and here we have both tissues, so in dark red, the symbiotic gastrodermis, and in the orange, we have the epidermis of the symbiotic anemones. And both show a very strong correlation of 13C and 15N signals with 0.9 and 0.8 R values. Now, when we then look at how much ammonium the host and the symbionts assimilate, we basically see that the host assimilates a significant proportion of the ammonium in the system. And this is very different from what lots of people thought. It was always thought that it's mostly the symbionts that do the recycling of the nitrogen. The problem being is if you allow your symbionts to recycle the, the nitrogen, then you basically expect them to give you the nitrogen that they would require for proliferation for free, right? And this is what we believe that what this is actually showing us is how the host uses its entire biomass to kind of keep pulling from that nitrogen to what once control the symbionts, control the proliferation, but on the other hand, also to produce biomass in an environment that is very scarce in nitrogen, right? So we have a system, and this is very important, that is not actually based on cooperation of host and symbiont, but rather on competition. It still produces a highly nitrogen efficient system but it is different in that they do not necessarily cooperate, but rather compete with each other, which we believe is why this symbiotic relationship is so sensitive. And also why this molecular pathway, at least in part, explains the Darwin paradox, why these organisms are so successful in this nutrient-poor environment, and also why they're so um, sensitive to things like eutrophication, for example. And with this, I'd like to thank all the people involved in this, and uh, mostly Gao Xin Xu, my former PhD student and now research scientist who has done most of the work. <laughs>